Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJTV News. Anchoring tonight is Brianna Venosi. Good evening. Welcome to NJTV News. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brianna Venosi. Tonight, Governor Murphy says we're ready to take the next step in New Jersey's road back to recovery, allowing for non-essential construction to restart and non-essential retail businesses to reopen for curbside pickup only. Both orders are effective Monday at 6 a.m. According to the governor, public health data from our social distancing efforts shows the number of new cases, deaths and hospitalizations are all steadily declining. In the last 24 hours, health officials officials reported a little over 1,000 new positive tests, putting our statewide total of confirmed coronavirus cases at more than 141,000. There are 190 new fatalities being reported today, with just over 9,700 lives claimed by the virus since the start of this outbreak. Another key indicator in the governor's decision, the state's COVID-19 positivity rate dropped again today to 22 percent. Experts have repeatedly pointed to this number as a better way to look at our testing results. For example, the World Health Organization says a 10 percent positivity rate indicates the government has done enough to capture all of the infected people in a community. But the governor warned any misstep will risk more outbreaks and deaths. The new executive order means customers won't be allowed inside stores for pickup and construction sites will stagger work hours and breaks to avoid overcrowding, adding when public health tells us it's safe to remove a restriction, he'll remove it. We're still in a stay at home mode. We're still stay at home unless you have to go out. And having said that, and so by the way, you got to eat, you got to um, go to the pharmacy. So there's certain ob obvious ex exceptions from day one that are essential, uh, and we get that. This is a step in, I think, a positive direction for all those retailers who are deemed to be non-essential. I think it's a responsible one. Uh, we, we just don't want people congregating. And Governor Murphy said he may soon take more steps to end other restrictions in the coming days and weeks, like vehicle gatherings, which are also no longer forbidden. That could be helpful as some churches resume prayer services today and look for new ways to reconnect the faithful. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. We are stating that gatherings of vehicles, such as drive-in movies or religious services, are not a violation of my order prohibiting mass gatherings so long as all participants remain in their cars. The governor's announcement easing the way for institutions of worship to accommodate outdoor services effective today will provide some solace to those who've been needing it. It's very painful for us. It's very difficult for us. Here. The spiritual impact of a pandemic is not easily seen, but among the faithful, it is felt deeply. And while the state's lockdown orders have shuttered almost all places of worship, holy men and women have had to minister to their congregations as best they could. But technology is not a place, and the impact is not the same. When you walk into a church, a synagogue, a mosque, any sacred place, when you're a believer, when you're a member of that religion, there is something that uh, surrounds you as you walk into the environment. And it triggers something inside of your soul. And parking lot services with congregants confined to their cars are not likely to do the trick. So religious organizations are working towards developing protocols aimed at somehow getting the doors to their houses of worship reopened. The Diocese of Trenton has chosen today, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, to begin that process, allowing local churches to open their doors for private prayer, no formal services, with strict guidelines. No more than 10 people can be in the church at the same time. They have to sit at a six foot minimum distance from one another. They're asked not to you know, come in and stay all day long to be conscious of other people who wanna come in. 
you know, there's, the restrooms can't be open. There can't be prayer books or papers or anything in the pews for people to use. Rabbi Moshe Hauer says the synagogues and shuls in the Orthodox Union have been advised to wait and see what other religious organizations do and what kind of success they have before they open their doors, even tentatively. This is a matter of uh, life or death, literally, and not just for our own communities, for our own uh, nuclear communities, so to speak, but for the, for the broader uh, American community, for broader public health. And we have to continue to be responsible participants in that process. In Bayonne, Pastor Gary Grindlin says his congregation has been yearning to reconnect to their place of worship, but he knows that that won't happen for a while yet. Still, he says essential work goes on. Our boots are on the ground, so we're, do, we're taking care of need. And so that doesn't change, regardless of what happens in you know, in Trenton or, or in Washington, D.C., we're still doing the work of, of our ministry. You could call the governor's announcement today a half measure, but spiritual leaders remind us that connections to the sacred can be made wherever and whenever you choose to make them, whether you're inside a house of worship or in a parking lot. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz. Well, as New Jersey moves forward reopening faith-based centers and non-essential retail business, scientists and medical experts are still frantically waving red flags over a coronavirus comeback, warning we're still far from being able to do so safely. Epidemiologist and UNICEF consultant Sharon Abramowitz says without better preparation, we'll face a major second wave of this virus soon. Sharon, you've denounced plans to uh, rush any reopening of the economy. What would it take to safely reopen? So if we think about uh, Governor Murphy's proposed road back to uh, the economy reopening, um, Governor Murphy has proposed you know, a sustained reduction in new cases, expanded testing, implementing robust contact tracing, securing safe places for isolation, and all as precursors to an economic restart. One of the things that we need to take into account is that each of those elements need to be in place and working seamlessly together at the same time in order for us to know that they operate effectively as a public health safety net prior to economic restart in order to ensure that when an economic restart happens, it doesn't lead immediately to a second wave of cases. Are you saying that that's inevitably what we may be setting ourselves up for? I do think that we're inevitably setting ourselves up for a second wave of cases, yes. By the end of June, uh, the governor announced yesterday that they plan to have about 25,000 test people tested a day. Is that enough? Is this just about testing? So, 25, that expanding testing capacity at all at this point is a, is a significant good. People need to know whether or not they have been exposed to COVID. However, in order for testing to be a meaningful uh, component of an epidemic response strategy, testing needs to be happening recurrently and repeatedly across localities um, consistently until the emergence of a vaccine. And so while we may have a substantial expanded testing capacity, we need to know that that testing capacity is being used once a week, three times a week, five times a week in schools and in businesses in order to identify not just the baseline um, in terms of the number of people who've been exposed to COVID, but people who are then, who, who then become exposed to COVID after that initial baseline. We're going to be adding an army of contact tracers per the governor's announcement this week. But just how difficult is that, Sharon? If you've got people riding mass transit, going back to buildings uh, where they work with presumably other offices, I mean, is contact tracing to the level we need it feasible? Contact tracing works extraordinarily well in a context in which there's restrictions on mobility. When you have a situation in which um, people's movement from place to place is restricted. Contact tracing can pretty readily identify uh, who has been exposed to a virus in a fairly short period of time. But when you have unconstrained mobility in the way that the entire state of New Jersey does in terms of its proximity to all the other states in the tri-state area, I mean, we still effectively have full freedom of movement. Contact tracing becomes incredibly difficult very, very, very quickly, and the epidemiology has demonstrated that. 
we have about 10 seconds. Would you advise from your vantage point hitting the pause button on reopening this summer? Yes, I would. All right, Sharon, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your insight. You stay well. Thanks a lot. As more restrictions are lifted, expect another kind of lifeguard to patrol the Jersey Shore this weekend. Cape May County is deploying social distancing ambassadors. Volunteers will walk the beaches and boardwalks, reminding everyone to keep six feet apart. They'll also hand out educational pamphlets as part of the county's Six Feet Saves campaign. It may not sound like an ideal summer gig, but it does give you an excuse to hit the beach. The Bergen County hospitals that were at the epicenter of New Jersey's outbreak are reporting promising news tonight. For the first time since this health crisis began, the health care systems are downsizing their COVID-19 units. It comes as the volume of patients and coronavirus cases decreases. But as doctors there tell Michael Hill, they're not breathing a sigh of relief just yet. A tearful clap out for Union City officer Octavia Robles on Tuesday. He spent more than three weeks at Holy Name Medical Center recovering from the coronavirus. He thinks he contracted it giving his mother CPR when she stopped breathing with what she thought was the flu. She has since passed away. Robles' exit got a hero's welcome. When Octavia went into the hospital, honestly we weren't hopeful initially. I can't tell you how relieved and grateful everybody is today. From the bottom of our heart. Robles' discharge is among the big drop in COVID hospitalizations in Bergen County's medical centers. We feel a little more distant from that acute phase. We still, we still know it's out there. We still know we'll see patients with it. But every day with less and less admissions and more and more discharges, we're feeling more comfortable with the new normal. Holy Name is down to 40 patients from a daily peak of 50 new patients, and it's reduced its number of COVID care units. If they need to come to the hospital, to the emergency room, or if they need to go to their physicians, or come to the hospital for testing or procedures, we are getting to the point where we, we, can, we can do that now. As COVID care has declined here at Holy Name Medical Center, the hospital has established a new set of protocols for non-COVID care. We've changed our registration process, so much if not all of it can be done online or, or on, on the phone. Um, we are pre-registering patients outside the hospital. We are asking patients when they get here to stay in their car and, and they'll be called into the hospital when we're ready for them. They'll be asked to wear a mask. If they don't come with one, we will provide one for them. How long do you expect, anticipate these kinds of measures will go on? I think this is the new normal until we have that magical vaccine. So I, we, we're expecting to be in this phase uh, for a good year, if not longer. At Hackensack Meridian Health Systems Hospitals, COVID-positive hospitalizations have fallen by two-thirds from their peak of nearly 3,000. But that's no reason to take the foot off the pedal, says the doctor who kept Dallas's Ebola outbreak to three patients. We're testing 100% of the patients that come into the hospital. Chief Physician Executive Dr. Daniel Vargas says that started Tuesday and 5% of those asymptomatics are COVID positive. Some go home to quarantine and monitoring. Severe patients are admitted to COVID care. The other 95% can go back to areas described as decommissioned, reconverted from COVID care, sterilized and tested. You can't say they're COVID free but they're, they certainly test negative for COVID. Hopefully that creates a much safer environment. But Dr. Vargas says a survey shows why non-COVID trips to Hackensack University Medical Center's emergency room are half of normal for May. Folks out in the community uh, are, are, are scared to come to the hospital. Dr. Vargas says as an added measure of confidence boosting, Hackensack Meridian Health will begin COVID testing all medical staff next week. Michael Hill, NJTV News. So far, testing has been the name of the game in our public health strategy to fight COVID-19, with new plans to double our capacity by the end of the month. But there's still a lot to be learned from the variety of tests available and the incomplete data sets they provide. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports on what you need to know before getting COVID tested. I just really want to find that if I'm positive for it in any way, whether I'm a carrier or, I've, or I have had it. We asked people lined up for COVID-19 testing in Hackensack, what do they want to find out? What tests do they need to get? 
A blood drop, saliva in a tube, swab up the nose? Depends on what you want to know. Whether or not I have it or whether I have the antibodies, and I'm not sure which one will tell you that. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't exposed to anything. I haven't had any symptoms or anything, so. Well, I'm not really sure what I really want at this point. Each test measures something different. Both the nose swab and saliva test can tell you if you're currently infected, if there's genetic material from inside the coronavirus in your body, making you a possible disease vector, even though you don't have symptoms. We're able to identify those that are asymptomatic but, but have the virus get them the help that the healthcare help that they need and also do the contact tracing along with that. So that's really what this is all about. The Bergen County mobile test site offers five to 600 of those tests daily, but only about 100 blood draws. Blood samples take more time and require a special technician. These tests check for the antibodies your body makes to fight the disease and can tell if you've already had COVID-19 and recovered. They can't really measure your level of immunity. The City MD Urgent Care Network recently had to clarify that after telling 15,000 New York and New Jersey clients they were immune. They're not. The serology tests are not meant to be an immunity passport. We don't know whether you know this is um, useful information for whether or not a person can return to work safely um, without the risk of possible reinfection. And now a company called Quidel is offering a brand new COVID-19 diagnostic test that just got FDA approval. It detects antigens, different proteins that attach to the outer covering of the coronavirus. The good news, it's cheap and blazing fast. If the test works, it's very fast. You can get a result in, I don't know, 10 minutes, something like that. But Rutgers' Dr. Martin Blazer says Quidel's antigen test only positively identifies the virus in 85% of patients. It returns a lot of false negatives, telling patients they're infection-free when they're not. You do a test to be sure. That's why you do tests. And if the test isn't 100%, then... You know, you have a gray area, and the bigger the gray area, the less value the test has. This antigen test is still, I would say, the first generation of those kinds of tests. State health officials reserve judgment on the antigen test. We're learning more as more of these tests come online at this point uh, as to whether we'd be recommending purchasing or we'd say wide skill that we should be going that way rather than a rapid test, rather than all these other tests. At this point, no, we do not yet have a conclusion as to what a recommendation would be. Bottom line, think of these tests as a snapshot, telling you if you have the virus or if you've been exposed to it. None of them can guarantee you have immunity. For that, we need a vaccine. In Hackensack, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. We're getting our first in-depth look at how the pandemic is impacting state revenue. So what does it mean for the budget? Rhonda Schaffler has the details and today's top business stories. Hey, Rhonda. Brianna, the financial wreckage from COVID-19 is pretty dire. Governor Murphy announcing this afternoon that April revenue collections in the state plummeted nearly 60%, down an unprecedented $3.5 billion. These numbers are a sobering reminder that the COVID-19 impact is not limited to the health of our people, but also to the health of our state's finances. In this report, income tax revenues plunge, but keep in mind, the state has extended out the April tax filing deadline, which explains the big drop. Meantime, Governor Murphy saying once again, the state needs help from the federal government. Advocacy groups say one way the state could generate revenue is by raising taxes. They want a fairer tax code, higher rates for wealthy residents, as well as a millionaire's tax. Brandon McCoy is with New Jersey Policy Perspective. If we don't raise revenue in an equitable manner, we're going to see cuts to programs that people are relying on more now than ever before. More people need support from the state. More people need rental assistance. More people need food and nutrition assistance. More people need unemployment insurance. Lost revenue and lost income is affecting everything. The state, companies, workers, residents, and of course, charities, which rely on the goodwill and generosity of donors. As NG Spotlight's John Reitmeyer tells us, there's a bill advancing in Trenton that would try to help charities by giving you a tax incentive to donate. So right now, New Jersey's not one of the states that offers a state level income tax deduction for charitable contributions like the federal government does. 
And so what this proposal would do is you'd now be able to write off charitable contributions that you make during the, the health crisis itself. Find out why charities say this would be a lifeline. You can read John's story in detail on njspotlight.com. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at the trading day. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. New Jersey American Water, providing water and wastewater services to keep life flowing for more than 190 communities throughout New Jersey. Treating cancer has looked a whole lot different during the COVID-19 outbreak. For these already medically fragile patients, it's meant tweaking, changing, and even postponing treatments. As Joanna Gagas reports, the situation created a separate health emergency for cancer patients during this crisis. I started uh, back in treatment in late March, early April of this year. And I was nervous about going. Ed Christensen has been battling a rare form of cancer called mantle cell lymphoma for the last year and a half. Like many battling cancer, when COVID hit, he was anxious about continuing his treatment. When I got there, you know, they immediately took my temperature, gave us some masks to wear, uh, wash your hands, those kinds of things. And uh, I was nervous at first, but um, I did feel comfortable as we uh, got going. And um, each week that I went back, there seem to be more things in place. Christensen's been treated under the care of Dr. Andre Gua at the John Thurer Cancer Center, part of Hackensack Meridian Health. He said they're taking every measure to protect this already vulnerable population of cancer patients. It's a very fragile population because they have chemotherapy, sometimes they have low blood count, they're immunosuppressed, sometimes they have respiratory issues and comorbidities because of the age, a number of factors that we all know are very critical factors for the outcome of COVID. So, we created that setup to protect the patients. That setup includes proper PPE on all staff, as well as masks on all patients. And they've limited the number of people in the building. You actually could only go in by yourself. I couldn't bring anybody with me, which was okay. We put in place immediately a process to screen patients the night before to make sure they had no symptoms or risk factors or anything suspicious and as well as the morning of, of coming to the cancer center. Early detection obviously is best, right? What do you say to people who are concerned that maybe something is wrong, but are really anxious to go get that first screening? Well, you're touching on something that is very important during the COVID. A patient have now become very scared of going to the hospital or going to emergency room or even going to the physician. Overall, when patients come to the hospital, we are so careful and focused on the COVID risk that actually patients are highly protected. And for those already battling cancer, Gua says keeping a positive attitude is critical, even though that can be hard to do right now. There's a huge emotional factor and also not being busy because the country and the, the whole world is on, on pause at this point is also anxiety generating. So the best way to face the anxiety is actually realize that we have made a lot of progress. I try to get out and walk a lot. I put on some music just to get away from it all because uh, you're, you're bombarded with uh, with all, in my opinion, a lot of negative stuff, you know, so you really have to just focus and stay positive, keep moving forward. I'm Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. An update from Tuesday's elections, the Atlantic City mayor is declaring victory in a special referendum. Voters rejected a ballot question that would remove the position of an elected mayor in favor of an appointed city manager. The proposal would have also cut four of the city's nine council seats. The final results of the referendum could take several days, but as of Tuesday night, more than 3,200 ballots were cast against the government change, with just 985 in favor. We leave you tonight with a story of incredible hope and resilience. After 49 days in the hospital battling the coronavirus, with 32 of those spent on a ventilator, Essex County Corrections Officer Sergeant Andrew Crooks was discharged from RWJ University Hospital Somerset, wheeled out to the cheers of ICU nurses and staff, and salutes from his brothers and sisters in law enforcement. Sergeant Crooks still has a steep recovery ahead, but if this battle is any indication, he'll be on the other side of that soon, too.
And a quick programming note on Friday. Join Senate President Steve Sweeney and senior correspondent David Cruz live for Chatbox. They'll be taking and answering your coronavirus questions. Email questions ahead of time using news at njtvnews.org with the subject line question for Senator Sweeney or just ask them live on the NJTV News YouTube stream at 6.30 p.m. That does it for us tonight. Head over to njtvnews.org where we'll continue to keep you updated. Ambriana Venozzi, on behalf of the entire team, thank you for being here. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever. Now more than ever, we're here for our members. We're working hard to make changes that can help keep your family safe. Now more of your costs are covered, so you can get the care you need. We've made it easier to talk to doctors and nurses without leaving home, and those costs are now covered too. So much is changing right now. What isn't changing is our commitment to you, your family, and your health. Here when you need us most, now and always.